Okay, so uh, welcome back to Applied Machine Learning. And um, it's been a while now, I think uh, four weeks since we talked about feature selection, but there were a couple of things that I still wanted to um, go over that we didn't get to uh, when we talked about this before spring break. Um, and so I'll finish up with that, and um, then we'll talk more about uh, automatic machine learning. So when we talked about feature selection, we talked about um, univariate statistics that we can use to select if a feature is uh, related to the target. Uh, but there's also more complex methods for feature selection. In uh, particular, those that are um, using multivariate machine learning models. And there are several ways to do this. In principle, what you might want is given a particular model that you would want to use, say you want to use a random forest, you would want to find a minimum subset of features that makes this random forest perform optimal. And so this way you could get a more uh, interpretable model potentially. But you can't try out all possible subsets of features because there's expo exponentially many. And so there are some heuristics that we can use to uh, select features based on uh, a, a, a given model. Uh, the simplest one is basically using some measure of feature importance and doing a single bit of a model. So um, we could say use a linear model or uh, even lasso. Lasso already selects some features automatically for us basically. So uh, we built a model uh, here, this is on the Boston housing data set. And um, so we have these uh, 13 features. And we can say, uh, we look at a measure of feature importance state of coefficients here. And um, then we select only the most important, say, um, only the ones that have the highest absolute value. Or in Lasso, we can also select all of those that are non zero. If we have um, a tree-based model, we could use the uh, genie importance or even better, the permutation importance, and then select based on the feature importance, what are the best features to uh, keep. So this is a single fit of the model, and then you can uh, select on this. This is implemented in scikit-learn oh, in uh, select from model. So select from model is basically a wrapper that fits the model once and then allows you to do feature selection based on the most important features in this model. And you can do this using either a threshold or a percentile of features. So this is not the optimum subset for this model because, um, well, we just select the best 5% or 10% or 50% or whatever based on the model. And so we could do this with any model. Um, here, for example, I, uh, used Lasso, I did a, um, adjusted the parameter alpha using Lasso CV, and it selected um, 11 of the 13 features. So it dropped two features, and then I, use, uh, I put this into a select from model. Uh, so the select from model basically makes the Lasso model a transformer that does feature selection. And so I make a pipeline that sca first scales the data, then I do the select from model with Lasso CV, uh, so this drops two of the features, and then I try an, a rich model, um, and uh, we can see that uh, just using the selected one, which has 11 features, does about as well as using the full model, which has 13 features. Um, so there's a question. Um, for the single fit, should we use uh, linear models or can we use more complex models like XGBoost? And you can use either. Um, so for the select from model needs to have some way to do um, feature importances. So it will use the built-in feature importances right now. There's no way to use that, to do that using permutation importance directly. Though that would actually be what I would recommend. So if you use, um, random forest or XGBoost in select from model, it will use the feature importance attribute to do the selection. Uh, so 
Instead of doing the single fit net selecting on the feature importances, we can also iteratively add or remove features. The, um, so you could either start with having no features and then select one feature at a time that gives the most improvement, or you could start with all features and select and add, uh, remove one at a time that uh, um, leads to the least uh, d decrease in accuracy. And so this is these are um, basically this is forward and backward selection, and there's different flavors of it. One of them is ca uh, called recursive feature emulation. So recursive feature elimination is basically um, an iterative version of select from model. So you iteratively remove um, you iteratively remove, say, one feature at a time. It's actually configurable how many you uh, remove at a time, but by, uh, by default, you remove one at a time. So you take any model that has feature importances, like a linear model, like random forest, like XGBoost, and it would remove, um, recursive feature elimination would remove the least important feature, would refit the model, would um, again compute feature importances, remove the least important feature, and so on. So instead of fitting the model once and keeping the most important features, it uh, iteratively uh, removes features and refits the model. And that can lead to uh, quite different results, in particular if you have correlated features. There was a question, so in the feature importance for the linear models, what does the, um, I guess the e2 to minus five um, refer to in the threshold? So this is, um, a th uh, you can look at the documentation, but by default, the select from model does um, the absolute value of the coefficient. And so um, it says if the absolute value of the coefficient is uh, greater than um, 10 to the minus 5, keep the feature, otherwise remove the feature. And there's some heuristics in select from model if you have a multi-class problem or a multi-target problem, how to combine. Um, and so basically, I just I said, don't use exact zero. I said, uh, use 10 to the minus 5 as a threshold to say a feature is important or not. Um, so another question is, why did I, um, well, excuse me, why did I do feature selection uh, using Lasso and then compute the scores on Ridge? Well, um, you could also do um, use Lasso, but basically the, the idea of Lasso is to keep, um, is to select some features. If I already basically dropped these features explicitly, there's not really any point in using Lasso anymore. Um, it was also a little bit uh, to illustrate that I could mix and match any models. So I could do feature selection using random forest and then build a model using rich. Um, it's unclear whether this is actually helpful, but it's something that Scikit-Learn would allow you to do. So, so, so recursive feature elimination does this um, stepwise, but it still relies on some measure of feature importance. So like the genie importance in random forest or the um, absolute values of the coefficients. And here's an example again on the Boston housing data set. Um, so one of the things is that you don't really get um, feature importance out of this to get, you get, excuse me, uh, you get a rank of the features. If you do RFE, it will give you a ranking of the features, which one was dropped first, which one was dropped last. And so here the thing with rank, uh, rank 12 is, Oh, sorry, rank 13 is INDAS. So this rank 13 is the least important feature. It was dropped first and so on. The rank one is the most important feature that was dropped last. You can, <laughs> okay, so the, the question that I got, uh, got now is, um, 
how, when do you stop? So here I, I said, and features to select one, I only, meaning I kept only one feature. The reason why I did this is so I get a ranking of all the features. In practice, obviously, I would want to keep more than just one feature. How do you figure out what's the best set? A simple way to do this is um, this model, RFECV. So this is recursive feature elimination with cross-validation. So it does recursive feature elimination within a cross-validation loop and then determines um, using cross-validation and scoring what is the best uh, number of features to keep. And so RFECV is basically, it's an efficient way to do grid search over the number of features in a sense. So it keeps just, keeps dropping for each, uh, for each number of features it keeps, it will um, give you the cross validation score and then it will um, tell you which one is the best uh, number of features to keep. And so that's what I did here. Use tenfold cross validation, RFE.support is uh, which features are, being kept. Um, and so you can see actually here two features are dropped and all the other ones are being kept. Okay, so it seems like the Remote lectures actually ask you, encourage you to ask more questions, and I'll try to answer a couple of them. But um, I also uh, don't want to spend too much time on all the questions. Um, I mean, one of the questions: Are these methods more reliable than permutation importance? And um, they do some different things. So permutation importance is for a given model: How much does this model rely on each of these features? Um, feature selection says. Uh, what is a, a good subset of features to uh, use uh, to build a model? And so you can use permutation importance as a basis for doing feature selection, and you could do it in one step with select for model. Well, select for model doesn't support it, but it, like conceptually, it's, um, it would be a good way to do it. Or you could do recursive feature elimination each time doing model, um, doing the feature importance with permutation importance. But so permutation importance is one way to give, for a given model, give you the importance of each feature, while here we're trying to find a subset. Another question is, if the, if the feature number is six, does that mean that methods search all possible combinations of six features? No. Searching all possible combinations of six features is infeasible. Um, if you have 10 features, then that's six out of 10, and it would be way too many models. If you have 100 features, it would be even way worse. Recursive feature elimination, as the name suggests, eliminates one feature at a time. So um, if the number of features to select is six, it says drop the worst feature, then the second worst feature, and so on, until you have six, six features left. So it's a greedy approximation. There's another variant um, that's a little bit more general than the recursive feature elimination um, that can be applied to any model. So the recursive feature elimination requires that you have a measure of feature importance. And so you could use the coefficients, you can use the gene ind index, or you could use um, permutation importance if you wanted to. Um, but if you're actually interested in accuracy or whatever metric you want, AUC, average precision, or something like this, maybe it would be um, more obvious or more direct to directly try to optimize the metric. So there's wrapper methods called forward and backward selection that greedily shrink or grow the feature set. But instead of using feature importances, they use um, uh, cross-validation accuracies. So they basically try a out um, what happens if I add or remove a feature? So in um, backward selection, you would um, start with all of the features. And then for each feature, train a model without that feature, do cross-validation, and get the mean metric. And then you, you uh, drop the feature where the mean, where the mean metric over the cross-validation is the best. So this means you do 
every time you drop a feature, you have to run trust validation number of remaining feature many times. And so the complexity of this is basically number of feature squared somewhat. So in the methods that I just described, they get from, so the select from model is a single fit of the model. Recursive feature elimination trains one model per feature that you drop. So if recursive feature elimination, you train a model, you drop the least important feature, you train a model, you drop the least important feature. In forward and backward selection, what you do is you look at, do a one step look ahead. So you basically, so you say, what happens if I drop this feature? What happens if I drop this feature? What happens if I drop this feature? And then afterwards you select the feature to drop. So this is um, computationally much more complex in a sense than recursive feature elimination. It's right now, not in scikit-learn. Um, it's probably gonna be in a future version right now if you wanna use this. It's in a package called MLX10 that's written by uh, Sebastian Rushka. Uh, so th uh, this has this uh, sequential feature selector class. Um, and so this can be used for any model. And you can say whether you want forward or backward selection. The forward selection would be start with a set of a single feature. So each individual feature just use this feature, then figure out which single feature works best and keep that, and then try adding a second feature to it for all possible features, see which second feature does best, and so on. So again, um, this is not trying out all possible combinations, but this is a heuristic that basically uses a one-step look ahead. Whereas, um, so this is like slightly less greedy than doing the recursive feature elimination. And so, um, yeah, so you can configure how many features you want to keep. And you can um, say whether forward or backward selection, and you can also co um, configure the metric. So here I'm using R square. Um, so one thing that you should keep in mind is that, uh, I said that last time, but always when talking about feature selection, you should think about what is the motivation that you have for doing feature selection. And very rarely will feature selection actually improve the accuracy of your model. So um, I talked about this again because um, it's basically part of the last, um, last task in the assignment where you want to find an interpretable model. And so one way you could think of making a model more interpretable is using a subset of features. So by selecting a subset of features, you can see if I can get a good model on four features, maybe that's more understandable than having a good model on 40 features. If um, interpretability is not of any concern or if prediction time is not of concern, then I usually wouldn't uh, bother with doing feature selection in my modeling process. So feature selection is something that I basically only look at doing this kind of automated feature selection if I want an interpretable model or if I need a compact model, say uh, to enhance prediction time. Um, so one question I think it was asked before and I didn't really answer it was, um, can we apply these methods after one hot encoding? And um, so this is a little bit odd in scikit learn right now. And so you can definitely apply each of them after one hot encoding. Um, and, but that might mean that you drop some of the levels and not all of the levels. So you wouldn't drop the categorical variable you would drop some levels of the categorical variable or some categories. And that, that could be informative so, or that could be interpretable, say, you only care if the car brand is uh, Porsche or Lamborghini and you don't care if it's anything else. Um, but that wouldn't really be selecting features in the original space. It would be selecting subcategories. Um, And um, the sequential feature selector, it does, well, okay, so the question is, should we select features first? So 
So it depends a little bit on what you want to do. So the recursive feature elimination um, and the select from model you can't do first because it needs a feature level, um, for each feature it needs feature importances, right? And so if you do a linear model, it only gives you feature importances for the one hot encoded variables. You could then try to aggregate them and say, uh, how important is a categorical variable by like say, summing up all the values for the different levels, but um, it becomes a little bit hacky, excuse me, and there's no way to do this in scikit directly. So um, the things that use feature importances in scikit-learn, you can only easily use them after one-hot encoding. If you use a sequential feature selector, because it doesn't, it basically doesn't know what features are, and it just drops one after the other and then runs the model. So sequential feature selection you could use before you do the um, categorical encoding. So you could use sequential feature selection on the original data. And I don't think there's like one answer to um, should you do it before or after because they just do different things. Like if you have different brands of cars, the question is, do you want to select whether you use the brand of the car or do you want to select which brands of cars are the most informative? And these are just two different things you can, you can do and um, they might both be informative, but in different ways. Yeah, so basically the question, should you select features first or last? In scikit-learn, it's a little bit dictated by the method you're using. Um, as I said, because there is no way to easily get feature importances for categorical variables um, with recursive feature elimination or select from model. So that would change if you use like, say you lose, uh, use like GBM or in uh, future versions of the histogram gradient boosting, these models can use ca uh, categorical variables directly. So you would get a single feature importance for the categorical variable. And then um, you could do feature selection with recursive feature elimination or select an, uh, uh, from model on the, on the categorical variable itself without one hot encoding it. So it depends a little bit on what your model can do. All right. Um, so now I want to uh, switch gears a bit and talk about parameter tuning and automatic ML. So I'm going to talk about some criticisms uh, of this uh, at the end, but one second. Okay. Um, but one thing that you should keep in mind is that parameter tuning is not the hard part and you shouldn't, it's like, in a sense, it's very, it's, it can be very important to tune your parameters, but it's usually not the thing that makes or breaks your model or your modeling process. Um, selecting the features, selecting the metrics, and collecting the data set, these are like the really hard, important parts. And so you should probably, you should spend some time on tuning parameter and selecting the model. But it's, if you are doing a real application, this is probably not where you spend most of your time. You should spend most of your time on evaluating models and um, thinking about the problem, not in like running giant grid searches. But this, so th but this lecture is about Let's say you did all you could, or maybe you're just giving a particular fixed data set and you really want to tune it as well as you can. How can you do better than just doing grid search? So um, in practice, you need to select not only the hyperparameters, but you also need to select um, among different models, among different hyperparameters, and among preprocessing methods and hyperparameters of the preprocessing methods. And um, often searching over these is uh, not super simple. So you can't always use grid search. For example, there might be conditional hyperparameters. Um, depending on which model you use, each model might have different hyperparameters. Or in SVM, if you pick a different kernel, 
um, different kernels might have different hyperparameters, different preprocessing methods have different hyperparameters and so on. So um, you can't really do like a grid search um, that because the parameter space is not grid shaped. Some, the existence of some parameters depend on the existence of the setting of other parameters. Um, so you can um, think of this process of selecting a pipeline, selecting a preprocessing, selecting a model, selecting hyperparameters together as one big black box optimization problem. So you put in the, uh, the configuration of the pipeline and the configuration of the hyperparameters. And um, what you get out is, say, some metric that you um, decided on using cross-validation. You can compute for each configuration setting, say, average precision or R square or whatever you like. And so do we have the formula? Why don't I, oh, why is the formula much larger, much later? Um, so this is known as the cache problem, um, which is, stands for um, combined algorithm selection hyperparameter optimization. And so the idea is to find the best configuration, so the model that gives you the best performance in, um, on this problem. So this is, um, as I said, a global optimization problem, meaning it's um, a non-convex function, and the parameter space is very big. So you have like, you, you can't really think of it as like an n-dimensional space because you have these conditional hyperparameters, and you have um, categorical parameters, and you have continuous parameters, and you have this, this branching via the pipeline. And so this is a really high dimensional space that's mixed categorical and continuous. And we want to optimize a function over it that is um, non-convex. So this is, this is an NP hard problem. It's a really hard problem. And um, it's probably impossible to solve, but we want to try to do the best job we can. So the thing that we did so far is uh, doing grid search, and grid search is basically just exhaustive search on all possible combinations. This has two issues with it. The first is we need to define the grid. So we need to define the resolution of our grid, and we need to know whether a parameter should be searched in lock space or uh, not in lock space. We need to define upper and lower bounds, and so on. Also, it's exponentially in a number of dimensions. So if you have, um, say, in gradient boosting, you might have many different parameters. So how many columns do you want to use per, per um, tree? How many rows? Um, like, how deep do you want the trees? What are the maximum features? What are the number of iterations? What is the learning rate? And so you can come up with like easily five or 10 of those. And so if you have 10 hyperparameters, then, um, and you have say five values for each of them, you have five to the, uh, to the 10 different combinations, and the space just becomes exponentially large. You also have this problem if you look at more complex pipelines. So if you have each preprocessing step, if each preprocessing step has its own hyperparameters, then again, the number of total configuration is exponential in um, the number of um, preprocessing steps. And if you look at things like um, neural networks, neural networks have so many different parameters. You have like number of nodes, number of um, uh, layers, and maybe a per layer learning rate or per dropout rates and so on. And so if you look at all possible combinations, this space just becomes way too big. And so, um, more formally, this problem of basically doing uh, black box global optimization is um, you're trying to solve this problem, which is just like you have some arbitrary shape parameter space lambda, and you want to maximize your function um, f, where f is um, a cross-validated metric. And here you can think of the uh, selection of the model also as a parameter. So you can have a categorical variable that says, is this logistic, do, do I want to use random forest or logistic regression? And depending on which of these two are used, and there's also the, uh, how deep do I want the trees to be, or what is the regularization that I want for um, logistic regression? 
And so you have this really large knowledge space and you try to optimize some performance metric. One strategy that sort of um, works surprisingly well is a random search. And um, in random search, you have to define a distribution for each of the parameters. And instead of trying all possible combinations, you just repeatedly randomly sample distributions. So this illustration here is from a paper from Bergstrom Bengio that's uh, quite famous now. And uh, they argue that doing random search can be much more effective than doing grid search. In particular, if some of the parameters are not important. Quite often, you don't know a priori which of the hyperparameters are important, which are not. And so here's these um, two figures where on the y-axis, you have an unimportant parameter, and on the x-axis, you have an important parameter. And um, both of these fi uh, figures evaluate nine configurations. But if you look at the grid layout on the left, the nine configurations only give you three different values of the important parameter. While with the random layout on the right-hand side, you actually get nine different values of the important parameter. So it gives you much higher resolution than um, doing the grid search, even though the total number of points is uh, the same. And so random search is actually very, very commonly used for hyperparameter tuning if you have high dimensional spaces. If you only have a two dimensional space, maybe it, it, the benefit is not that big, but if you have a high dimensional space and you assume that a lot of the uh, parameters are not important, then the random layout will be much more effective than uh, doing a grid search. Also, you can um, basically just keep going and the amount of computation you spend on your search is independent of the size of the search space. So you can just say, um, well, I want to run 100 iterations, and it'll run 100 samples. And if you say, oh, well, I have more time, I want to run 1,000 iterations, so you can run 1,000 iterations more. It's not that easy to do that with grid search, where basically the grid layout you specify defines how many parameters there are. And it doesn't really make sense to stop grid search halfway in between. In random search, you can stop at any point. Um, to do this with scikit-learn, there's um, a class called randomized search CV, and it works just like grid search CV. Um, if you give it uh, a list of things, it will randomly sample from that list. And so here's an example for um, excuse me, a random forest. And um, if you really want to get this benefit that I uh, illustrated here of having uh, this randomized layout, though, you don't specify lists, you specify um, random state, sorry, random distribution objects. Do I have an example of this? Well, I only have it for integers here, but um, you can provide continuous distributions. So let's say you are doing a uh, grid searching for an SVM. You can say, well, I want a lock uniform distribution for C and I want a lock uniform distribution for gamma. And um, then you don't have to specify a distribution. You still have to specify upper and lower bounds, but you can just like keep it running for as long as you want. And if you run out of patience, you can stop running it and it will give you the best result you have so far. So in this, um, so you can either give it lists or um, random uh, distributions. Random distributions, you can use anything that's in scipy.random. And uh, basically, it requires things to have an RVS method, so which stands for random variate sample. This is the standard way to sample from distributions in scipy. All right. So this is actually already like helpful for high dimensional spaces and it's one of the standard methods that you should know about. And even though it seems kind of simple, it's something that is um, used extensively. Another nice thing about it is that it um, paralyzes um, 
natural way. So if you have a cluster, you can just run random search on each machine and then in the end pick the best result. They don't need to coordinate as because every sample is a random sample. So what does n eater search n eater search equal to 20? Oh, so here there's n eater equal to 200. And that means it samples for uh, samples 200 iterations. Oh, there's n eater search equal to 20. Yeah, that, that line isn't used. I'm sorry, I should remove that line. Um, I guess I had a variable, and then later I replaced the variable by 200. So I just ignore the NHS search one. All right. So another method that's used for global optimization is Bayesian optimization also known as uh, SMBO or sequential model-based optimization. And so this is like um, a more advanced technique that can be used mostly if, you're, if you have a high-dimensional parameter space that is continuous. And so this is also one of the standard methods. It's particularly useful if you um, if you, training your model is very expensive, so if you have a neural network and um, if you really want to find a very good optimum. So this is, um, this has often been used, I'm pretty sure like if you look at uh, stuff like AlphaGo, at least the early iterations use something like this. I think these days they probably use um, genetic methods, but um, many, um, state-of-the-art results in the past use this SMBO, this vision optimization. And so um, let me try to illustrate how this works on a problem in one dimension. So usually you would do this on higher dimensional problems. Um, it works on problems that are like not very high dimensional, but also not so, um, but so high dimensional that you don't want to do grid search basically. So you maybe don't want to do it on a thousand dimensions, but maybe on 50 dimensions or 20 dimensions, it works well. And doing grid search on 20 dimensions is basically not possible. All right, so here on the right-hand side, you can see an illustration for a single parameter. So here, on the, let's say on the x-axis, your hyperparameter, and um, the... Um, dotted line is how the performance depends on the um, on this hyperparameter. And so this is a non-convex function and we don't know it. And training our model takes a long time. So we want to figure out where's the optimum with trading the least amount of models possible. And so in this first picture, we already tried two different parameter settings. So this is one parameter setting here, and this is another parameter setting here. And for each of them, we did ran cross-validation, and we got this, um, uh, this, say, accuracy score and this accuracy score. And um, now, this is called model-based optimization because now, given these, uh, these uh, two observations, we're building what's called a surrogate model, and we the, we don't know the underlying function. The underlying function is cross-validated accuracy, so it's really hard to compute because we need to train a model and do cross-validation to compute the underlying function. But we can now try to build a regression model on these two observations. And um, this is the black line. It's the regression model that we built on these two observations. The uh, Bayesian optimization is built around regression models that also give you an uncertainty estimate which is like this gray purple shaded area here. And so um, we fit this model, like in this toy example, it's only two data points. Obviously you would have a couple more data points in, uh, in a real uh, case. And after we fit this model, we look at what are the points that are, um, that look like they would be good candidates. So in a sense, we are now trying to optimize the, um, the surrogate function. So here, um, 
if we would believe the surrogate function is the true function, then we could just optimize this function. Optimizing this function is much easier because um, we actually potentially have a closed form um, way to optimize it, or at least um, evaluating it is very easy. Evaluating is, it is a prediction in the regression model that we built. Whereas evaluating the actual function was like training a neural network and doing cross-validation. Um, so if we would believe this surrogate model, we could say, well, um, where's the maximum of the surrogate model? Uh, I guess say, say it's here, and then we would uh, try this point next. However, that would be like very greedy. And what we do instead is we take the uncertainty into account. And so um, one way to do this is what's called the upper confidence bound. And in the upper confidence bound, we look at, if we um, look at our estimate plus the uncertainty, what is the best point um, or what is the highest bound we can get? And this would be here. So here, what's um, the acquisition or utility function green is basically um, what is the, um, the mean plus the standard deviation. And so these are points that look like um, they might be good. So um, they are very high, but we might also have a high uncertainty. So it's plausible that there's a high value there. And this is the point where we look at. This is, gives us also like an exploration exploit, exploitation trade-off in that it um, tries to look at points uh, where we are uncertain more. Okay, and so here now, which we look, we say this is a point that looks promising, we're very uncertain, but it could be a high value here. And so um, then we evaluate this point next. So we train a model with this parameter setting, the acquisition max, and we do cross validation. So this runs for a long time, and then in the end we get uh, this X3, our third observation. Then we refit our surrogate model. So we get a new solid line here. Um, that now goes, and we get decreased uncertainty. So we observe now that here, um, the point is here, so our uncertainty estimate here is pretty low. And um, so now the next good model is, um, so the next uh, point that we, we would try is here, again, using the upper confidence bound. Um, this is the point where it could be high, but we also have high uncertainty. And um, uh, so now we try this point, and this is the point x4. And then so we iteratively build new models. OK, I have the question, what has anything to do with parameter tuning? Well, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to iteratively find a, good, a point that will get, give us a high accuracy score. So instead of searching all possible values, or instead of searching um, over a predefined grid of values, we try to figure out what is the best value to try. Let's say training each model takes a week, and you only have um, uh, one GPU, and you want to train, uh, so you can train one neural network a week. But you know the hyperparameters are important. And so the question is, how do you tune the hyperparameters? You, every time you run your model, it'll take forever um, to get to new observations. You want to make sure that you really try the points that give you the most information. So here, the point is try to find an optimum um, parameter setting with um, the minimum amount of tries of uh, configuration that we actually run. Because actually evaluating the function takes a long time. So um, there's several different acquisition functions. And uh, the one that I said here that is used in this figure is um, upper confidence bound. So basically, if your model gives you, so your model needs, your regression model needs to provide an uncertainty estimate. And so then it is the mean prediction by your regression model plus the, uh, say, one standard deviation. And so you look at the maximum of mean plus one standard deviation, which is like the, the purple contour here. 
Um, is this at all related to MCMC sampling? Um, it can be in many ways. That, uh, um, I mean, MCMC sampling is a way to do sampling. Um, I think, I'm not sure if I know how to answer the question. I mean, um, what we're trying to do here, the, in MCMC sampling, you're trying to get an accurate picture of a distribution that's unknown. What we're trying to do here is find an optimum. So we're trying to get more and more information about the location of the optimum. And so we're trying to figure out parameter values that are more and more pro that are promising to give us information about the position of the optimum. So we're not, we don't actually care about knowing where the function is everywhere. We only want to figure out how the function looks around the optimum because we care about finding the optimum. All right. So. Um, There's a couple of different uh, ways that people, uh, uh, a couple of different regression models that people use. So um, the two most, or they're the three most commonly ones are Gaussian processes, random forests, and um, then there's one that's called uh, tree parse and window estimate. Um, it's a non-parametric estimate. And so um, they were, several different groups uh, working on this problem. So this is a problem that's quite well studied. So um, I can probably name like four startups that have as uh, a product do the thing I just explained as a service to tune your neural network. Um, and so um, basically, the main choice is what are you using? So what one line that's missing in here is actually neural networks. So people are now doing also using neural networks to build the surrogate function. Uh, actually, maybe neural networks are the state of the art, so I should definitely have the line here. So that is Bayesian neural networks. So you want anything that can make a prediction, but also give you a good uncertainty estimate. And so um, the picture just now was for Gaussian processes. Um, Random Forest is um, in, a mo in a library called SMAC. There's non uh, these uh, non-parameter uh, TPE estimates, and then there's um, neural networks. And um, I give like a, a brief overview here. So one of the things is that Gaussian parameter Gaussian processes are sort of the classical way to do it, but they can't really deal with um, discrete parameters well, with conditional parameters, and they're not very scalable. Um, the random forest uh, kind of work better, but they're not as well um, evaluated in the literature. There's one group in particular that has been working with this um, for many years, uh, the group of Frank Hutter in Freiburg. Um, they're the people that do auto -SQ learn. And so, um, yeah, but it seems to work very well for them. But it's not like a super standard approach. Um, in general, most of these will basically work. However, I mean, one thing you should keep in mind is that this problem of global optimization, so we're trying to solve this problem, right? We're trying to find a point in a high dimensional space that gives us the, the best value of a very um, complex function. This problem is NP-hard, so it's impossible to solve. So in theory, if you're unlucky, um, none of this will help. Um, so we don't fit the distribution of x, no. We fit, so we fit the function that goes from the hyperparameters to the accuracy. So here, you should think of the x-axis as like the regularization parameter and logistic regression, and the y-axis as the cross-validated accuracy. Only that if it's actually something as simple as having a 1D problem, you probably would just do grid search.
Yeah, no, so uh, yes. So the axis here is, uh, is hyperparameters, exactly. Okay. Um, so this, this is basically one of the standard methods. Um, there's some other methods for doing this um, high dimensional optimization. One of them is um, evolutionary methods. There's one library called teapot that uses that in, um, for doing like standard machine learning pipelines. This is not as commonly used if you're looking at neural network architectures. Actually, um, genetic algorithms, evolutionary methods are very commonly used um, in what's called neural you know, architecture search. And so, um, but we're not gonna talk about this actually. Uh, we might talk about this at the end of the semester, but today we're thinking more about like center cycle learn pipelines. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of implementations of this. There's uh, SMAC uh, with the Vernon Forest model. There's Spearman, which is the GP, HyperOp for a TPE. Scikit Optimize is a library that does um, several of these. And there's GPyOpt. Um, that does a GP-based one. So Spearmint and Hyperopt, I don't know if these libraries actually still work um, because they're like several, like five to 10 years old or something like this, maybe five to seven years old, so they might not be ported to Python 3. Um, but GPyopt uh, works pretty well if you want to use Gaussian processes and otherwise uh, Scikit Optimize or SMAC uh, work well. Um, so, as, as I said, um, one of the biggest criticisms of these methods, though, is that um, they might not actually gain you that much. So the problem is NP-hard, so you can't really, like, if you're unlucky, it might just be as bad as doing random search. And there was um, a famous blog post about this that uh, was basically comparing uh, SMAC and TPE and random search on uh, tuning different uh, data sets. So on the right hand side, you can see it. There's data set. There's 12 different data sets, and they gave it like some particular budget, say 100 hyperparameter runs or something, and they um, did it with random search, with SMAC, and with TPE, and they found actually the difference is not that big. So just doing random search is about as good. And if you look at the average rank over like over 117 data sets, so they tried to do this hyperparameter tuning on many, many data sets, and they uh, ran it with the same um, budget for SMAC, TPE, and random search. And um, then uh, they saw, well, if you, um, give it a certain budget, the SMAC NTPE is like, has a better rank than the random search. So, oh, sorry, lower rank is better here. Um, but actually, what if you don't worry about all of these uh, relatively complex methods and just buy a second computer and also run random search on a second computer? So random to X here basically means running random search at twice the speed or meaning running random search on two computers. And so basically what they're saying is that if you run random search on two computers, it beats running either of these fancy methods on one computer. And so that's sort of an interesting baseline um, because actually this is like, as I said, the random search is like, um, it's embarrassingly parallel, it's naturally scalable. So these days, it's very easy to just spin up 10 machines and run random search over them. So it might, in a sense, be uh, more effective to just do random search in parallel instead of trying to do some fancy method. Um, and so here, I linked the blog post. Um, from, this is a blog post from Ben Recht. He's like a very famous machine learning theorist. Um, sometimes a little bit opinionated, but uh, he's done a lot of amazing work. Um, 
And so here you can see basically the, the difference in um, uh, how different algorithms do um, given a, uh, for a given budget. And you can basically see here, um, well, if you run random search at twice the speed, it mostly beats everything. Um, though SMEC actually here, SMEC does pretty well on some of these benchmarks, uh, if you give it a lot of uh, budget. So in particular, you can see here that if you, um, if you don't try a lot of parameters, uh, hyperparameters, then random search probably is pretty good. But if you try um, to find the optimum very, very precisely, then um, like doing SMEC or TPE might help you. But now obviously you ask yourself, well, what is this line at the bottom that beats everything all the time? It's ob obviously it's their method that they propose in, their, in the paper that these graphs are from. And so this is the method I wanna talk about next, which is called uh, hyperband. So hyperband is um, an instance of what's called multi-fidelity search. And the idea here is to go beyond the black box. So before we just said, well, we have a function that given a hyperparameter set, it computes the accuracy of our model on using these hyperparameters. And, um, but actually, so, and this problem is really, really hard, but we actually have more information in this. For example, um, we could run our model for just a little while and see how good it does if we have a, an iterative optimizer, like a neural network. Or we could run our model on a subset of the data set and see how good the parameters do. So the idea behind multi-fidelity optimization is that um, you can um, have a, a cheap, surrogate of the actual function that's not as accurate, but it still gives you some information. So if you basically, if you run your model for a couple of iterations or on a subset of the data, it's not going to give you the same result as if you run on the whole data set, but it's still going to give you some information. Um, yeah, there, there's a couple other methods that we're also going to, that um, I just want to mention before we go more to multi-fidelity optimization. Another one is meta-learning because, um, so the idea of meta-learning is that basically we don't need to start our search from scratch every time. It's as like a machine learning researcher, you don't like start tuning parameters and trying out pipelines uh, every time from scratch. You use your experience on other similar data sets to guide what kind of models you should evaluate. And meta-learning basically emulates this process of learning what works on what data set. Okay, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about multi-fidelity search first. So the idea is that you can um, approximate the function by a cheaper function. And so here, I'm, uh, let's say I want to search uh, the parameters for a, a kernel SVM. So I have two parameters, seed and gamma. And we know that um, the time to train the uh, kernel support vector machine scales pretty badly with a number of samples. So it's somewhere between uh, squared and cubed. And so this is here on the digits data set, which is pretty small, um, because I, you could also run this on the MNIST data set and it would be more dramatic. And so let's, Let's say we go back to just using grid search. And so we have our grid over scene gamma. And um, you can see that if you say, take 10% of the data, you can already sort of, so this is the one on the very left-hand side, the computation only takes two seconds. Whereas if you um, take 80% uh, of the data, which is maybe what you would do in uh, cross-validation, it takes uh, over a minute. But the information about the location that you get is um, still pretty good. So maybe we could uh, rule out some of the parameter settings 
that do very badly even on a subset of the data. So it's pretty obvious that like if looking at the 10% the thing that um, the optimum will not be in the top left or the bottom right corner. And so maybe we can throw away some of these parameter settings and uh, not waste time on them. I did a similar thing for um, uh, random forests. So here in, in the top row, I just use subsets of the data set. So I use 10% of the data, 20%, 40%, 80% of the data. Um, for the random forest, um, I said, well, I can, uh, could either do subsets of the data or I just use less estimators. I know the runtime is linear and the number of estimators. So let's see, and more estimators will always give me better results. But what, what happens if I uh, just use 10 trees? And what is the effect of max depth and max features with 10 trees? And what does it do with 40 and with 80 and with 160? And you can again see that um, some of the parameter values I could rule out very immediately. And so maybe I could figure out that max features equal to 64 is not that good and that max depth equal to four is not that good. And I can uh, rule out these parameter settings without spending a lot of time. And so, um, yeah, actually maybe, um, maybe let me get, skip the multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization or just very briefly. So you could combine the Bayesian optimization with the multi-fidelity and that might be a good idea. It's a little bit tricky to do though. And this is something where there's sort of an active area of active research. Um, something that's more straightforward is combining the multi-fidelity with grid search or random search. And um, that is called, uh, or the simplest variant of that is successive halving. The idea in successive halving is that um, given n configurations, so let's say we have our grid of parameters over for the support vector machine, and we have a budget. Say we want to train only, I don't know, only 100 support vector machines. Um, sorry. Actually, the budget is formulated in terms of resources, so let's, let's say, um, It's, it's easier to say for like a random forest, let's say uh, we want to, in a random forest, let's say we, we don't want to build more than a thousand trees which, uh, because trees are a good estimate of like how long it will run. So let's say we want to build uh, no more than a thousand trees. This is, the thing is called successive halving because um, you have the parameter space in it every iteration. Though so actually um, in practice, the number three is better. So if you divide your parameter space by a three, it's better. Um, but the word, wording is all for halving. So I'm going to call it halving, even though I mean dividing by three. So let's say I decide I want, uh, in my first iteration, I train 10 trees. Then I um, evaluate all my hyperparameter settings on 10 trees and I keep only the third, uh, one third of the parameters that do the best. And then I um, triple the amount of trees I, bu I build. So that means I would do um, say 60, sorry, 30 trees. And um, then uh, train on the remaining hyperparameters. And again, keep only the third best. The formula on this slide just tells you how to compute given a fixed budget, how many uh, resources to allocate, but actually I think it's a little bit confusing, so don't worry too much about it. Um, so this is, right now, there's a pull request for this in uh, scikit-learn, and it's probably gonna be in the next release. It's also implemented in Devil, if you wanna uh, try it out. And so here's just some computational example. Let's say we have 81 configurations, so 81 combinations of hyperparameters we want to try. And we say, oh, um, let's say we only want to use, um, uh, say, we want to uh, build 20,000 trees in total. 
and um, then in the first iteration, you would train all the configurations and you use 31 trees. Then you would only keep one third of the configurations that are the best and would triple the number of um, trees. Then again, you would keep only one third of configuration, triple the number of um, uh, trees. Again, then you have, you're left with uh, three configuration and you triple the number of uh, trees again. And then finally, you're left with one configuration that you run on uh, these resources. And the way this is, the math is done basically means that the total number of trees are less than your budget. Um, so the sum of all these numbers is 16,000, which is smaller than 20,000, which was the budget we allocated. In the real world, um, we probably don't care about like a very fixed budget because we care about wall clock time and it's kind of tricky to estimate wall clock time, but the principle is the same in that we basically, um, we start with some minimal budget and then we increase the budget and the budget can be either number of on the number of samples or it can be on a number of iterations or the number of trees in the forest or anything like that. And we say triple the budget in each iteration and we only keep the um, one third of the parameters that work best. And so here's like a different example plotted in a slightly different way. So let's say at the beginning we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and uh, eight hyperparameter settings. And um, for, and we run with this particular budget, um, we eliminate the ones that are bad, the, uh, in this case, the thing that I called at our earlier is um, one half, meaning we only keep one half the configurations. Um, then we run them with more budget, we keep only half, we run them with more budget, we only keep half, and then we run that on the full budget. So this actually um, is, uh, a much more efficient way to search the space instead of training the full model on all parameters. So this is much, much, much faster. Um, one of the issues here is that you might throw away good configurations very early. And um, if your minimum budget is, to, is very small, you might uh, throw away configurations that actually like need more data or more iterations to work very well. And um, there's, an improvement of successful pathing that's called hyperband. Hyperband basically runs several um, versions of successive halving that are what they call um, differently aggressive. And so they run successive uh, halving first with like a very small budget and keep throwing away a lot of the configurations very early. And then they run half as many configurations randomly sampled, but I give them twice the budget. And then they randomly sample again, half as many configurations and give them twice the budget and so on. And so basically what you're doing is at the very beginning uh, in hyperband, you run successive halving with many configurations where you throw out a lot of them very quickly. And in the end, what you're doing is basically random search where you pick just a few configurations, but you run them for a very long time. And this kind of hedges a little bit your chances of throwing away good configurations too early. And they have beautiful math that shows you that's a great idea to do this. Uh, in practice, it's not entirely clear how much this hedging helps against uh, just doing the success of halving. I think the, the jury is still a little bit out for that, but. Um, a lot of people uh, love hyperband, and so this is this is the thing they're doing, which is basically running successive halfing with different different amounts of a minimum budget uh, several times. Okay, here's the formula. I don't actually want to run through the formulas. I think it's right of. Probably unlikely that you'll implement this yourself, but I think it's good to understand uh, the main ideas. If you're interested in this, it's the, uh, 
there's a pretty extensive journal paper on hyperband that's um, quite interesting to read. Um, though, really, it took me um, doing so, running through some examples by hand to figure out what what the what all of the rounding actually means. Um, so one thing you can do is so this hyperband works very well in throwing off away configurations that are really bad. And so um, what Bayesian optimization does really well is getting uh, really good when it's in distinguishing configurations that are all pretty okay, but some of them are like a little bit better. And so um, there's um, some algorithm, there's a, a series of papers um, that basically combines Bayesian optimization and um, uh, hyperband and um, so one of the things called DOHB and there's hyperbandster. I think actually, I'm not sure if both of them are from the Freiburg group. Um, and basically uh, they say, well, we're, they're much faster uh, than random search. Um, and basically, so HRS is random search, TPE is just Bayesian optimization. HB is um, hyperband, DOHB is Bayesian optimization plus hyperband. And so here you can see that if you have, um, like in the beginning, once you, when you start your search, hyperband is very good at finding uh, promising things uh, very quickly. Whereas if you do random search or Bayesian optimization, it takes a long time to actually get started. Um, but then if you run, Hyperband, um, in the end, it will not do so well because um, it basically just, Hyperband basically just do, uh, does random search in a smart way. And so if you do Bayesian optimization, you can uh, find the actual optimum more quickly. And so it says here basically that um, in the end, you're much, uh, you get much uh, faster to the optimum if you do Bayesian optimization. Um, later on. Yeah, so this is still an area of active research. And so this paper, I think is probably now two years old or something like this. But if you're interested in, um, these are sort of the two, two areas are the multi-fidelity stuff um, that uh, tries to use low, but, um, low resource versions of the, uh, or early stopping or something like this. And, um, Uh, and then Bayesian optimization to um, really find the best parameter setting if you already have um, run many trials. We're nearly out of time. Um, that's too bad. I want to just very briefly mention meta learning. So recently, meta learning has been. Uh, the phrase has been very much adopted by the neural network community and uh, they mean something slightly different usually than what I mean. Here I mean meta learning in the sense that learning from experience for general machine learning problems. So this is not, I'm not going to talk about MAML here. Uh, maybe we'll talk about MAML later. And so here the idea is that we can learn on, um, from past experience on other data sets, what will work well on this data set. And given that we're kind of running out of time, um, I'm only gonna be um, getting over this a little bit. So one of the things is you can run many algorithms and you could just rank them. What is the best algorithm on average? Um, that's sort of the most stupid strategy. And uh, you can try out algorithm based on how well they performed in, um, in the past. There's one thing that I'm quite uh, that I quite like, which is build portfolios of diverse algorithms, so that um, if you try k algorithms, let's say if you build a portfolio of ten algorithms, then you know that there's probably one good one among the ten. So these are diverse and um, work well on average, basically. Um, and then there's things that are called uh, meta features, meta models, where basically you try to build 
um, a model that goes from what's called meta features, which is like say number of samples, number of features, and maybe any maybe number of classes, class imbalance, and so on, and goes from statistics of the data set to the best to a hyperparameter setting. So basically, uh, this in this meta learning, you would say given a um, given I have a data set that looks like this, what is the best hyperparameter setting? Um, there's also, you can phrase this as a recommender system problem. There's, I love this paper, probabilistic matrix factorization for AutoML from Fuzi et al. Um, what they're basically doing is they're doing a recommender system for scikit-learn uh, pipelines. So they run this on, so they use uh, 42,000 machine learning pipelines and um, using naive Bayes, random forest, XGBoost, and linear discriminant analysis with different hyperparameter settings. And um, they basically create a recommendation algorithm and use that to figure out for a new data set, which is the best parameter setting that you should try. And so, yeah. Basically, you can talk for an hour about just this model, and uh, I just wanted to give like a broad overview. So um, if you're interested, I think this is a really excellent paper to read. Um, there are so many excellent papers in this, but um, maybe just a couple of things. So if you look at implementations, I think the state of the art implementation is auto SK learn. Um, and uh, this is doing Bayesian optimization with SMAC. So they keep iterating this. So actually, um, I'm not quite sure what is the standard algorithm that they're implementing right now, but this group has been working on uh, AutoML for a long time. Uh, a downside of AutoML is that, sorry, AutoSKL Learn is that it runs for a long time. So if you run it on the digits data set, it runs for like an hour before it gives you the first result. But if you have a lot of time and you want the best model, AutoSKL Learn is a good choice. Um, so there's some criticism to these, uh, to all of this work that I definitely want to mention, which is um, it's unclear if we actually need all that many classifiers. Turns out in practice, just using gradient boosting usually like kind of kills it. So if you just use gradient boosting, you might do well enough and not select over all the different models. It's also not clear whether you need complex pipelines or whether just doing like um, some imputation and maybe some target encoding is enough. Um, also, um, a lot of the methods that um, do AutoML, they actually ensemble models, so they both many, many models, and then they average the top 10 ones. This gives, gives you, um, as we learned in the ensemble lecture, this gives you even a better model, but it might also give you a model that's very, very complicated and not easy to interpret. If you have a model that's an average of XG boost linear regression and three neural networks, how are you gonna ever explain what that, mo that model does, right? Some people say it's actually, ma this is making machine learning too easy. Um, and people use it in ways that they shouldn't. I think it's an orthogonal problem, and I think you should always think about model evaluation and your application first before doing anything else. Um, one interesting find from the from a paper from the Auto SKL Learn group um, when they worked on portfolios was that basically um, they ran uh, Auto SKL Learn on a big set of benchmark data sets. Uh, that's basically a, a search over many, many different complicated scikit-learn pipelines. And they found out um, just using XGBoost instead is usually fine. And so in the end, only X, so they built this portfolio of like, what are the best models to try if I have a limited time? And all of the models were XGBoost models. Um, after basically searching over all of scikit-learn, they found, I'll oh, just run XGBoost. And they, they, did an, they did a very 
a thorough experiment and that was the outcome. So that's like a little bit sobering maybe, but uh, also quite interesting. Um, if you want to play with this and uh, you want something that runs a little bit faster than um, auto SK learn, I already uh, made you play with Dabble a little bit in the beginning of the semester. And uh, so Dabble has a thing called any classifier that also implements this portfolio optimization. And so this runs successive halving on a portfolio. So this basically uses a simple form of meta learning together with successive halving. And so um, if you want to try it auto, auto ML, this might be also a simple way to do that. All right, I'm already five minutes over. Um, but I'm happy to just uh, hang around and answer uh, any more questions. I know this was like a lot of material, but this was more like a broad overview. I gave you um, reference to this um, automatic machine learning book. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you should definitely read up on that. There's um, yeah, a lot of interesting information in, in that book, and it gives us a very good overview. But other than that, it's, that's it for today. And I'll see you on Wednesday. So one question that I got now is, um, can we say that AutoML usually ends up with more complex models? And the, the thing, it depends what you allow it to do. And a lot of the systems are designed to be very, very flexible and to like basically throw anything you got at the model, uh, at the problem. And then in the end, they might find a very, very complicated model. Um, you could do, and so I think the answer is yes for most existing AutoML systems. Um, but there's nothing that says you can't build explainable models automatically. Um, it's actually an area I'm quite interested in. I don't think anyone has really tried it. Um, so there's another question about the feature selection. Uh, is there an easy way to get the feature names um, that select from model selects inside a pipeline? Okay, and so I think I said it a couple of times. So right now, the feature, how feature names are handled in scikit-learn is uh, not great. Um, and we're still arguing on how to best do that. Um, and um, basically, select from model has a thing has a Boolean attribute called mask, or maybe it has a get mask function. Um, either one of the two, and it gives you a Boolean mask that you can apply, and that tells you these are the features it kept. But you need to get out the feature names before that, then you need to select with the mask and um, basically manually do the selection on the names. I have an implementation that does this automatically within a pipeline, but it's not merged yet, because we're not sure if it's the right way to do it. So right now it's a little bit annoying. Um, and the question is, uh, would it reduce runtime to use sequential feature selector before using uh, AutoML? Well, select, sequential feature selector is um, based on a model, right? So which model are you using? And so if you already know which model is a good model, then why do you run um, auto, like a bigger AutoML system? So you could run a sequential feature selection within the AutoML uh, system, but I don't think that will get you much in terms of runtime. So the question is, uh, so AutoML is mainly for hyperparameter tuning, but not for feature selection. Uh, yeah, well, hy AutoML is hyperparameter tuning, but not, but also considering the model selection as a hyperparameter. It is only an accident of me running over last time that both of them are in the same lecture. They're basically unrelated. I mean, not entirely unrelated. So you you can have feature selection as a processing step within a pipeline that is built by an automatic machine learning system. It's just not something that necessarily uh, will benefit much. 
if you look at the pipelines that are found in automatic machine learning systems, they usually do not contain a feature selection step. That's, yeah. Someone messaged me privately, professor, but um, I don't see the question, so. Okay, I'll, I'll wait a couple more minutes if there's any other questions. Maybe I'll stop the recording. All right. Stay safe, everybody, and thanks for showing up for a lecture.